Hello, everyone. Welcome to the uh, Open Forum and the Combustion Simulation Webinar. So uh, it is my great pleasure to introduce our uh, speaker today, uh, Professor Weir uh, Warinen from Arto University in Finland. So uh, the title, as you see from the slide, the title is uh, Fast Reactive Flow Simulations Using DLB Form. So the method and the applications. So before the webinar, uh, please allow me to introduce uh, Professor Weir uh, Warrenen. So uh, Professor Weir has received his uh, Master of Science degree in computational physics in 2004 in the Helsinki University of Technology. And uh, he uh, got his uh, Doctor of Science degree in 2010 in compu uh, computational free dynamics at uh, Aalto University, Finland. Since, two, uh, since 2014, Professor Weir has worked as an assistant professor in energy and fluid mechanics at Aalto University. And he was tenured in uh, just this year. So uh, congratulations. Yeah. Um, Professor uh, Weir has uh, published uh, uh, around 80 uh, peer-reviewed journal publications on fluid dynamics in uh, different uh, uh, energy applications, including heat transfer, reactive flows, and uh, two-phase flows. So the research um, mainly involves usage of open form for reactive multi-phase flow applications in engine combustion context with a particular focus on spray ignition of dew and uh, chi fuel uh, uh, mixtures. So the research focuses on usage of large edge simulation and the director numerical simulations. Recently, the team has developed a chemistry speed up techniques enabling efficient finite rate chemistry, LES, of uh, reactive sprays. So now I give the time to you, uh, Professor Weir. So now you can start. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the introduction and it's a pleasure to have this op opportunity to give give this talk in this uh, uh, active seminar series. I have understood that I have about one hour time or so. Please correct me if I'm I'm wrong. Uh, but during this one hour time, I will discuss about indeed the recent developments on DLB foam. I will talk a little bit about the method and show some applications of our research. The purpose of this talk is to give a, some kind of overview of our research and, and stay on a level which would be uh, which wouldn't go too much into detail but still still be interesting enough I hope. And I would like to acknowledge my contributors and my collaborators. Um, the contributors to DLB form are listed over here. Uh, they are my PhD students, former PhD students, uh, and and col other colleagues, postdocs. Uh, and of course, I would like to acknowledge the funding from Academy of Finland and and the computational resources offered by CSC. Uh, in this title slide, you see a picture of uh, a spray, a spray flame, a non-premixed spray flame. And uh, this was actually published in Combustion and Flame. It was one of our first reactive flow studies done by Armin Werfritz, my former PhD student who is nowadays assistant professor here in Finland, University of Turku as well. And Armin, Armin simulated the ECN engine combustion network spray A target case. So here, for those who are not familiar with spray flames, uh, we have liquid droplets, world as Lagrangian particles. Uh, these droplets evaporate, so there is a liquid length, some length at which the liquid part terminates. So in order to have liquid terminating, you need vapor, vapor, vaporization, so you need mixing. So there needs to be turbulence that mixes the ambient hot gases with the liquid core so as to 
evaporate the droplets. And after the liquid length, there will be some early chemistry, early chemical reactions happening. Uh, it's a diesel type flame, so modeled as endodecane surrogate fuel, C12. And finally, we have some uh, hot, hot flame, hot high temperature chemistry occurring, high temperatures later on further away. And, and the flame, it's a lifted flame, so there is some flame lift of length where it is standing. And in those times, in 2016, we didn't know much about combustion. We are still learning, learning a lot about combustion, of course, very extensive topic. But uh, what we wanted to do in projects was to better understand dual fuel combustion. And by dual fuel, I mean that instead of this being oxygen, you have something else here as well. So in our case, in Finland, we are interested in, 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 in marine engines, combustion, compression, ignition engines. So actually this oxidizer is consisting of uh, for example, if you have a natural gas engine, uh, CH4 and oxygen, air, and so it's a low reactivity fuel, which you have as oxidizer in the ambient, premixed, assumed to be premixed commonly. So what you want to do is that you want to have a high reactivity fuel like diesel, I write D for diesel, and this spray flame is used to ignite the low reactivity fuel in the ambient, the main fuel. So you inject a little bit of diesel, you compress, you ignite the diesel, and then you have this little spray flame, and then you will have uh, hopefully, hopefully a successful combustion in the whole cylinder filled with uh, methane or methanol or hydrogen or mix of these fuels or gasoline. Anyhow, this was the starting point, and we wanted to better understand how to model this. So we wanted to get rid of FGM for that time being. We wanted to get rid of flamelet uh, methods and to better understand the details of the combustion. So we wanted to do finite rate chemistry. But as we know, finite rate chemistry is very slow. Uh, uh, then we needed to develop some strategy to accelerate that finite rate chemistry. But that was as an introduction to the topic. I will talk about this more during this talk, but I will start first as, as some background. Actually, this introduction was, was mostly given already, uh, but maybe I would like to mention that presently our research team is about eight PhD students, six postdocs, and uh, senior researcher who is associate professor actually nowadays as well. And then to mention about open form, uh, I have supervised eight PhD theses on open form related to different applications regarding combustion, multiphase flow, heat transfer, and co-supervised three PhD theses. And uh, indeed, I was tenured uh, just a few weeks ago. So uh, this is my career in a nutshell. Uh, as a, a further introduction to what kind of problems we have looked in the past, uh, indeed, uh, marine engines, uh, spray flames in engine context are in the core of our research. Then we have looked at some, let's say, coarser models like G equation, larger dissimulation. Uh, that was in a simple engine geometry with a moving piston. Uh, and what I will talk about is spray ignition. Uh, 
yeah, DLB form is, is a important development in our team. We've looked at methanol and power to X, so production of fuels in catalytic beds. And some heat transfer problems, uh, multi-phase flows like in biofuel injectors. During COVID, we, we looked at airborne viruses. Uh, and actually, I think my most cited paper is about uh, airborne viruses uh, from 2020. Uh, we studied uh, aerosol transmission and were probably among the first ones to publish something on aerosol transmission and CFD uh, in the summer of like, June 2020 or so. Uh, and also some problems in marine hydrodynamics wave formation. Uh, there was one PhD student who defended last year regarding that topic. So this is an over, overview of our, our research. We use high performance computing, uh, mostly open form. And nowadays, we've started using also MATLAB for GPU computing. Uh, so certain types of problems you can run quite efficiently with MATLAB. So, for example, indoor airflows we have been investigating with rather large system sizes, so up to 200 million cells, uh, LES simulations. Uh, we use the CSC supercomputers and runs are quite large and require quite a lot of storage space, mostly due to the large number of species uh, in the systems, combustor systems. Uh, and regarding methods, uh, unless otherwise stated, um, we are typically using implicit LES, so no TCI modeling. TCI is a, a super important topic. Uh, and I suppose the cause of the greed, the, the more important that topic becomes. Uh, commonly, we are doing quite fine scale simulations, and this assumption uh, may be most suitable for ignition type problems. If you don't have deflagration fronts, your ignition. Uh, but sometimes we use DNS or EDNS, maybe we should call it quasi-DNS uh, or quasi-embedded DNS. And that's what we use when we are doing resolved flame simulations. I will talk about those more in the end of my talk as well. But let's go to part one, TLB form. What is TLB form about? So DLB, by the way, stands for dynamic load balancing. Uh, first of all, some news. So recently, we published four video tutorials online on DLB form usage. Uh, so how you use it, and what is the theory and method and download, and how you run the tutorials, and so on. So, so you can watch them yourself. They are about 10 minute tutorials each, so rather quick to go through. And DLB form, it can be downloaded from all the GitHub repository. And the publications, it's based, published in two, two journal publications in, in computer physics communication and, and physics of fluids. So, so the physics of fluids paper is extending the the earlier paper. So DLB form 
it's a dynamic load balancing model for reacting flow simulations. And it features a load balancer, a reference mapper, a fast analytical Jacobian evaluation thanks to the PyCheck library and fast linear algebra routines via LAPAC. And I will talk about these topics next. So first of all, the governing equations we have are the standard mass momentum and species and energy equations. And in DLB form, we use the operator splitting. So chemistry source terms, those are solved separately from the flow, the subcell level. And to estimate this is certainly the most time consuming part of these simulations. So we have a thermochemical state vector which is formed for each cell and for each time iteration. And you want to update from previous time step to the present time step, the state vector. And for each cell, we find a thermochemical state, the next, next value, uh, by solving the chemical equation. And we use the Soilex algorithm, which uses Newton's iterative method as internal step. And you need in Newton's method, the inverse of the Jacobian or the Jacobian matrix defined as a gradient of the, of the source terms. And this is essential step. So here, here we use the PyCheck library, the open source PyCheck library uh, to estimate that Jacobian matrix. But instead of matrix, matrix inversion, we use LU decomposition and back, back substitution. So we do this with, with the standard LU decomposition, nothing special over here. But usage of LAPAC is, is essential to speed it up and implement it. So rather, rather standard things, but uh, still essential to speed up the code as I will show you soon. So PyCheck and LAPAC, they are uh, defined in the, in the input files for, the, for running the simulations. And you can watch the videos yourself and, and hear more explanations about the settings and tolerances uh, defined in these input files. Then, as you remember, DLB stands for the dynamic load balancer. So what is load imbalance? So load imbalance problem in reactive flows. So this is just an example to demonstrate what load imbalance means. means. So we investigate as a model problem uh, endodecane shear layer. So the red stripe in the middle is uh, endodecane jet. You have periodic boundary conditions and the jet is going 20 meters per second from left to right. And you have ambient, the blue is oxidizer, oxygen air. And you want to ignite this shear layer. It's like a moral problem of a diesel shear-driven problem. So here you have, have a 
have a picture of the Kelvin Helmholtz instabilities and temperature field. You see ignition happening in the shear layer where the mixing and the most reactive mixtures occur. But now when you do a domain decomposition of this, suppose you have four processors, you see that different parts of this domain are not in balance regarding the chemistry source term evaluation. So there are parts which are, let's say, almost idle. They are not doing anything, very little chemistry ha happening. And some parts where you have a lot of, most of the chemistry is happening, for example, at processor three. So how to, how to avoid this load imbalance? Uh, here you see the cell CPU times for a more developed later time step. So you see that different cells take different time to estimate the uh, chemical source terms. So there is, there is load imbalance certainly, depending on, on how active the chemistry is and in which phase, phase the chemistry is, is at present. And here you have a video of what's happening. You have the, the reactions taking place in the shear layer. And below, you see how the chemistry CPU time is evolving on different time steps. So you see that different processors, these colorful lines represent different processor CPU times, they can be a lot above the mean, or they can be almost negligible. So there is lots of variation between the load between different processors. So on the, on the left, I mean, the standard approach, you don't do anything, any load balancing with the standard, that's what it means. But when you turn on the DLB form, you see that the variation of the individual processors, the CPU time, chemistry CPU time variation is very confined. So the variance is very small and they all coincide, almost coincide with the mean uh, CPU time. So this is, this is the benefit. You don't want to wait for a long time for one processor to complete its tasks when you can balance the load. Another feature of DLB form is the reference mapping approach. So in this case, for instance, you have a situation where you have a lot of oxidizer in the ambient. So why to compute chemistry in the oxidizer if there is no fuel present? Uh, so why waste? computational resources to the ambient. So what you can do is you can calculate the reference solution in only one single cell defined by a certain cr criterion given in the input files. And then you can map it to the green cells, the other cells, because it's the same, same chemistry happening everywhere. And this question becomes certainly like more relevant if you, if you have a, a dual fuel mixture. So the oxidizer is not only air, but it's, for example, methane and air or methanol and air. So in multi fuel problems, this becomes a very, very essential feature to have the reference mapper. So that completed the part one and, and the methods, oh, some of the key, key things behind DLV form. And now let's proceed to part two and some examples using DLV form. And this is mostly going through the paper uh, 
from this year in physics of fluids. So what was DLB form about? It was about chemistry CPU time balancing between different processors by distributing chemical source to them evaluation equally between processors. So here in the top, you see just an example. If you don't have DLB form, it's a random example with, let's say, 64, 64 processors. Uh, the slowest processor is taking 12 seconds. So why bother waiting 12 seconds for that to finish when you could do it in four, four seconds with DLB form? So that was the in a, in a single slide one one of the one example of the benefit what you want to aim at you want to aim at that all the processors are taking the same same amount of time to not wait for anybody the slowest one uh, this is a simple single single cell zero d problem calculated by DLB form so. What it shows is that the CPU time is reduced by several orders of magnitude with PyJack plus LAPAC uh, for GRI3 mechanism. It's a very, very simple problem. But uh, uh, what it shows that if you don't do not anything, the execution time can be very, very high. And here we have, by the way, the absolute tolerance. And uh, you want to keep it rather tight usually in reactive flow simulations. So you see, if you switch on PyJack, you win already a few, few decades here. You switch on LAPAC, you win even more. Of course, how much you win depends on what, what kind of tolerance you have and this, what problem you have and how many CPUs you have and, and various, various things, what mechanism you have and so on. But I will I will discuss this this kind of uh, benefits uh, of PyJack and LAPAC and DLB form in in what what follows. So let's start with the two D Kelvin Helmholtz problem. We have this endo decay endo decay jet here in the center. And then we have the oxidizer over here. And in this case, I'm now switching more to the dual fuel side. So the oxidizer is air CH4 mixture. So the purpose is, as you remember in dual fuel, you want to have a spray, diesel spray, which ignites the ambient premixed low reactivity fuel. We used the uh, YAO mechanism from 2017, 54 species endodigen chemistry and 239 reactions. Okay, so you see, see how the endodigen concentration is mixing and you get the vortices uh, over here. And yeah, because it's dual fuel, also the ambient is igniting. So you kind of see like, like a reaction front happening over here so the ambient starts burning uh, at this point i don't say still is it the flame is it the deflagration or not but i will comment on that later on in a more realistic uh, context anyways this is the uh, toy problem we did by dlb form and and here we see speed up factors in the range 24 to 38 uh, with DLB foam and PyJack uh, switched on. So depending on the number of processors, 8, 16, and 32, we studied in this small example, you can get up to 38 speed up factor in contrast to not using these. Uh, speed up techniques. So that was a simple 2D problem. Another problem 
uh, we looked at this or demonstrated in this publication was stratified dual fuel combustion. So in RCCI engines, you you have, I mean, we I typically envision so that we have a low reactivity fuel, let's say methane, fill, filling a cylinder of the engine. So you you essentially have premixed the low reactivity fuel, the main fuel, the cylinder, and then you inject the diesel spray or at the relatively early crank angle so that the piston is, let's say, coming up. You inject the diesel, so it has a lot of time to mix. And as a result, you will have a stratified mixture. Like uh, it's not fully premixed, but you have rich regions and you have uh, uh, spray lean regions, a dual fuel mixture. And in this case, one, one question that you, you may have is that, okay, you will have, you want the mixture to ignite and then burn. So how the combustion is happening? Is it ignition, like ignition front, or is it the flame propagation? Does it really create the diff, uh, diffusive, uh, 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 let's say, deflagration flame structure at the reaction fronts? So. Here we studied the ignition to flame, flame transition, or demonstrated it as a test case. And uh, indeed, uh, investigated the joint combustion of these, interactive combustion of these two fuels. So, they, so you can basically use this for academic test cases. That's the main point of this, this exercise. And another thing is that this, was completely impossible to do with any the, the, the standard approach. So you need the DLB foam and pie jack and these acceleration techniques to, to actually do this kind of simulation. So it's an enabler for doing, doing this kind of uh, academic test cases, DNS type simulations. <laughs> Then another test case we looked at in this paper was the 3D Easy and Spray A. Uh, again, we used the Yao mechanism and DLB foam is uh, also completely necessary to solve the problem. And here speed up by a factor of 250. 50 is reported. So it's, it's a true enabler for running these simulations. Uh, you actually see a little bit better what is the structure of a typical diesel uh, spray flame, what we capture in the simulations. Uh, so, so you have the evaporation and mixing of the liquid, you have the low temperature combustion, high temperature combustion, and then indeed the diffusion flame uh, later on. And we also provided some validation against the easy and reference data. So how you typically validate, you, you have vapor and liquid penetration, here's time. So you just, vapor penetration is like how long the cloud is, how long is the spray. So it's growing as a function of time. And then you have liquid penetration and you want to match the reference data. That's how you calibrate that your mixing is, is, is correct. Uh, and some other ways of validation, flame lift of length uh, compared to the experiments for diesel spray and IDT, ignition delay time, matched also with experiments at different temperatures, ambient temperatures. And also we validate in terms of the uh, formaldehyde fields, so experiment versus large eddy simulation at different time instances. So you, you, you want to have this cool flame, low temperature reactions, and the position of those correct as well. Uh, so when you have the mixing fine and the liquid length fine, then you have a good chance of getting also the, the chemistry. I mean, it, it's a precondition for getting the uh, 
low temperature reactions in the right location. And of course, you need a good chemical mechanism also to capture these, these phenomena. Uh, then furthermore, as a last example, we showed in this paper was, was premix flame, 3D Sandia flame D. It's an old, old test case. And also there, the DLB foam was completely necessary to actually solve this combustion problem. We were not able to uh, complete the simulations with GRI mechanism, but we used a reduced 19 species, DRM19 mechanism with 21 species and 83 reactions to match the species and temperature and mixed fraction uh, or jet profiles between simulation and experiments. So as a result of that paper, we were able to demonstrate usage of DLB foam in different combustion types in multi-fuel problems and spray combustion, non-premixed and premixed combustion and uh, partially premixed combustion. So somehow covering uh, these basic combustion modes encountered also in, in combustion engines and also other applications. And indeed, this was all without TCI modeling, with essentially like implicit LES either on coarser, coarser or finer grids, but anyhow, no, no TCI modeling involved here. Then let's discuss a little bit more about spray assisted ignition of dual fuel mixtures uh, there are quite many recent papers that we have published on on dual and tri-fuel combustion where dlb foam is used so we are using it now as a sole tool for our research uh, we've used it in uh, to simulate RCCI combustion under dynamic pressurize, we've used it in dual and tri-fuel combustion, tri-fuel referring to adding hydrogen or substituting part of the methane with hydrogen. So you would have hydrogen, methane in the ambient, premixed, and then you ignite it with the diesel. So you have three different fuels, interactive combustion of them. Uh, we also did methanol, hydrogen, diesel, dry fuel quite recently. Um, but anyway, here I decided to just discuss one paper. It was a combustion of flame paper from 2019, and it was on dual fuel ignition. It was the first dual fuel uh, LES study as far as I know in in a sp like spray spray study I mean so diesel spray assisted ignition of lean methane air mixtures so what is dual fuel pilot ignition uh, so what we want is that we want to we want to ignite uh, premixed methane by diesel so in the ambient you have a CH4 plus air which is hot, otherwise it wouldn't ignite. And you inject the diesel as step one. So you have a mixing of a diesel, diesel cloud over, over here in step one. And in a step two, this diesel is auto igniting. So you have ignition typically here in the tip of the spray. The fuel has had most time to react. Uh, and dilute and mix and chemistry is 
ready to kick in with the high temperature reactions. And then as a final step, uh, when the diesel has auto ignited, you hopefully uh, ignite also the ambient methane. And that's the main, main point of having this spray assisted ignition of methane. But certainly one open question here in literature has been that is this a flame and how long time does it take to develop this flame and or is it what is it actually that we're looking at and uh, comment about that uh, in the end of this talk but anyways the ignition is typically happening like this so the simulation setup we used a few different grids we also did some grid, grid sensitivity tests uh, but what you typically what we typically do on the finest grid level we have a 62 micrometer uh, grid here and you want that the vapor is mixing or staying in this fine grid region during the entire uh, duration of the injection or at least until the time of ignition and indeed here are the configurations so for easy and spray a so we what we used as a baseline was the easy and spray a so it's a well-defined condition for endodecane 19 micrometer nozzle fuel temperature injection pressure it's a continuous injection ambient temperature 900 density 22.8 and the uh, oxygen uh, air content is even here as well and of course in the in the standard spray a there is no methane so uh, methane phi is is zero and what this paper was about was to take the ECN spray A, the spray endodecane injection from the ECN conditions. And then we modified these conditions so that we added methane to the ambient uh, surroundings, to the ambient air, so as to ignite the, ignite the ambient with the diesel. So that's DF stands for dual fuel. So it's the modified spray A. Okay, these values are changing a little bit, but we try to keep these the same as much as possible. Ambient is still 900. Uh, and instead of this being zero, you have now 0 0.5 lean methane in the ambient. Uh, first of all, some chemical mechanism validation. We typically don't have validation data for dual fuel combustion so what you can do is that you can validate take a mechanism endodecane mechanism and say that okay i want to validate it in single fuel methane and single fuel uh, endodecane combustion and then we use it in a dual fuel setup assuming that it then then works so some validation studies on flame speed and and ignition delay times and so on. I think the main main uh, one of the main checks in spray context is 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 that we want it to match the spray. So for easy and spray A, we want it to match the 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 the, the, the CH2O fields with the experiments, the easy and experiments. And you see that depending on the mechanism, is it Yao or is it polymy? Polymy is a bit larger mechanism. Uh, yeah, we are approximately there. And there is some deviation between Yao and polymy even in single fuel case. But anyways, we believe that this is the best we could do in this case, validate it in a single fuel and easy and spray A case. And then we wanted to go for, for the dual fuel case. And here you see again some basic things. You see how the 
the typical stages of ignition, you have uh, liquid evaporation, turbulent mixing, then you have activation of low temperature chemistry, uh, RO2, uh, high temperature ignition, finally, in the tip of the spray. And based on our, our findings, what is typical is that this, um, when you add methane to the ambient, it will slow down the uh, ignition. So you will have longer ignition delay time <clears throat> for the spray in dual fuel cases commonly. Here, further comparison between Yao and polymer mechanisms. So some space-time evolution of low and high temperature ignition regions. You see that qualitatively you have same locations, but indeed the two mechanisms predict for dual fuel ignition with different ignition delay times. But anyway, you will have these ignition ignition kernels happening here in the tip, and those will then burn the endodecane, which should further burn the methane in the ambient. The black stuff is methane air. Uh, we did some comparison between, or may, we did many types of comparisons, but here is the simplest one, probably. Uh, ignition delay time. So what is characteristic to this kind of fields is that you have a two-stage ignition. You have first stage ignition and then you have a second stage ignition. And uh, for both of these we have we, we measure the uh, ignition delay time. So over here you have a, just a pure single fuel like a diesel and the ECN conditions. And here you have the dual fuel fuel case. So in the single fuel case, you match the experimental data for the second stage ignition delay time rather well with experiments. For both of these mechanisms, there is some discrepancy, but, but uh, some mechanism works better than the other one. And in dual fuel, uh, yeah, you see that the mechanisms differ more in terms of the second stage ignition delay time. Second stage means it's just a the standard ignition delay time for sprays. And so there is some mechanism dependency in single fuel and dual fuel as well. And what is interesting is that we did a mesh comparison and for 160, 80 and 62.5 micrometer grids, uh, the ignition delay times are very similar that you get for dual fuel. So we concluded that this may be grid insensitive uh, result uh, that we report in the paper. Uh, so that, that was about roughly about dual fuel. Uh, ignition problems. And then I have still a few few slides regarding some of the most recent work and work in progress. So what are we currently working on? Uh, we are working on different types of problems. Here are just some examples, uh, some recent work on DLB foam. So for example, this was a recent paper by Parsa Tamadonfar in flow turbulence and combustion this year on premix combustion, ammonia air and methane air flames. Uh, then we use TLB form to study tri fuel, so spray assisted ignition of methanol hydrogen plants, uh, which was published in International Journal of Hydrogen Energy. Um, and we also implemented a 
density-based version of this code so that we can actually simulate shock waves and knock phenomena. Uh, and our first experience is from 1D simulations have been submitted and the paper has been revised, so it's still under review. But we studied gasoline surrogate fuels and studied different modes of ignition in certain test problems. So, uh, so that also we were able to uh, model the uh, detonation type phenomena. But until 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 this point, I have talked about mostly about implicit LES in the spray context. So uh, running simulations on the sixty-two micrometer grid of the yeah, the spray spray cloud mixing and uh, low temperature reactions and high temperature reactions. Yeah. So I have talked mostly about implicit LES in the spray context. But to conclude my talk, I, I would like to talk mention about recent ongoing work. So a long standing question is that what is this? this thing that we have inside the red box actually so okay we have certainly we have ignition that's that's clear but then because the ambient is now also a fuel so the ambient should start burning uh, and the question is that are we looking at ignition or are we looking at the flame and Probably at some point it would become a flame, but how long time does it take to develop into a flame? And there are like several open questions about this topic. So that's what takes me to give a few final comments about embedded DNS of dual fuel spray assisted ignition. Uh, using DLB for format, open form. So what does embedded DNS mean? Uh, I think it, first time it has been used maybe 20 years ago already. Somebody could say that it's simply like very, very, very tight grid refinement in a certain part of the flow. Uh, but we are talking about locally highly refined simulations on a background LES grid. So what we start with is that we have this, our baseline, the published work in, in several journals and combustion and flame on the dual fuel problem. So we have the modified spray A, which has been validated and published on the LES grid. So you have the spray flame, spray ignition, not the flame, but ignition of the spray. So we get the mixing and uh, and then hopefully ignition somewhere here in the tip of the spray. So that's kind of like a published starting point for the follow-up work. And what we do then is that, okay, we identify the point. Actually, it would ignite over here. This is the point of ignition. So we do the LES, we see that, okay, this is where it ignites. We see the first ignition kernel. And we draw this green box around this ignition kernel. And we do a factor of 10 refinement in this region. So we have successive refinements refine, 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 refine uh, until we are happy, until we reach the flame scales. And I recall that we 
used as a criterion to have 10 grid points per flame thickness, laminar flame thickness. So refinement. And here, here you see still a nice, nice sketch. Uh, it's, it's, this is all work to be submitted and courtesy of Mahmoud Kadalla. Here you have a schematic, nice schematic about about what 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 this kind of uh, studies could actually mean, or to put this into some kind of context. So you have an engine, you have a piston engine, you have a compression, you have intake port, and you inject the methane from the inject port in the, in the intake port. And what you have here is that you have these little spray flames, diesel sprays which are supposed to ignite this premix methane. Uh, and <clears throat> what we are now looking at is one of these spray flames over here. We, we don't simulate the full engine, we don't simulate the compression because the compression time scale is, is quite low in comparison to the uh, injection and ignition time scale. So we assume that the ambient is still uh, fixed conditions. Uh, and we simulate only one spray, and and here the focus is now on this window that we are looking at. So all the time this LES simulation is kind of living in the background grid very, 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 very slowly. So it is 62 micron is always in the background. The spray is slowly evolving in the background, but the we look at very short time scales, like a fraction of fraction, some fractions of millisecond inside this small box. And here you see what is happening inside this small DNS embedded DNS box. You see how the first kernel is starting at the ignition delay time tau two, and how it is uh, growing in size. So you see certainly how the ignition kernel is evolving and it stays inside the, ref the finest refinement level uh, we, we make or create. Uh, it's a massively parallel simulation, a multi-computer. It uses over 10,000 cores and 1 million CPU hours without post-processing. And the number of computational cells is 316 million. And the data storage is 50 terabytes. And this is indeed work in progress to be submitted really soon. But here, some first evidence on deflagration fronts around the developed ignition kernel. So here you see a slice, a slice of temperature field. You see how the temperature field is growing. And the isolines here denote uh, methane mixture fraction values. Was it 0.5 and something else? But anyways, you see formation of these thin zones uh, around the uh, kernel, and the hypothesis is that this is a premixed flame. Or if you wait for long enough, then it becomes a premixed flame, a deflagration front. And what we did was we did energy budget analysis. I mean, we did many, many kinds of analysis, but this is just the simple, simplest one, probably. Uh, to look at the energy budget across the thin zones between the burned and unburned regions. So three sampling lines, uh, lines one, two, and three, here, here, and here, and normal to the flame front. And we look at the, the energy budget, reaction convection, and diffusion terms, and you see that these are roughly in the same order of magnitude, the, uh, especially the <clears throat> diffusion and reaction terms. So, so we conclude that this, this is the first sign of, of the of deflagration fronts emerging in dual fuel uh, spray assisted combustion. Anyway, more analysis will be found in the full manuscript when it is published someday. So to conclude, uh, TLB foam 
can be used for many different problem types. We have used it for many different problem types. Combustion studies are not easy and TCI modeling should be looked more at. Uh, the relative importance of TCI modeling depends on the problem type and the grid resolution and, and turbulence modeling approaches. But uh, certainly I think the DLB form is a very useful tool. We use it in our research actually only nowadays in combustion problems and uh, all the acceleration techniques that are offered by DLB form should or could or should be used probably should be used because at least to my understanding they all provide consistent and successive uh, speed up improvement for the uh, reactive flow simulations. But anyhow, that concludes my talk and thank you very much for this opportunity once again. Thank you very much, Professor Weir, for your wonderful presentation. So uh, next we will um, uh, go through the questions from the audience. Okay, so uh, may I first check, is there any questions from the panelists? So if you have, you can unmute yourself and uh, ask the questions to uh, Professor Weir. Any questions from the panelists? Okay, so uh, maybe we uh, we have some questions from the Q and A. So uh, I will raise the questions uh, on behalf of the audience. Okay, so the question, uh, the first question is from uh, Domenico Lehaya uh, from uh, PU Deft. Okay. So uh, several questions. So the, uh, thank you for a uh, uh, most wonderful presentation. So the first question is what linear systems does La, La Pac sell? Uh, a linear system for all species per sale or a linear system for all sales per species? So uh, can the linear system solve the further accelerator using a outer Kirchhoff acceleration? For example, using uh, PTS, uh, sorry, PET, uh, PTSC4, four. I think this is uh, one kind of uh, open form solver. Yeah, so this is the first question, yeah. Uh, I'm not sure if I understand the question correctly, but I, I understand it in, possibly, possibly it's meaning that each cell has its own uh, Jacobian and this is evaluated per, per cell. So uh, then the LU decomposition is done for that Jacobian per cell. Uh, I hope this answers some part of the question. Okay. I don't know. I don't know about the details of this acceleration. Furthermore, because uh, my PhD students and postdocs are working on the details of these algorithms. But yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you. So the question two about uh, uh, PyJack. So how is PyJack used in parallel computations? So is a Python engine started on each processor? Does it calling a uh, Python PyJack from within C++ open form come with any burden or difficulties? So does PyJack? So is it actually uh, started on each processor? This is his uh, first question. So called from uh, does the so is it from open form or is it from like uh, Python? Yeah, it's it's from from them, like from from from. I don't know. I don't think it's from open form. It's 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 a. Uh, it's from, from separate, the, right? separate. Yeah. Yes. Mm, okay. So the next one is Fig three and Fig six. What is a blue curve baseline method? Fig three. Uh, figure. Uh, three and six. Which figure? I'm not sure. I think probably uh, KO she didn't mention here. This is figure six. Yeah, I, I guess here. Yeah. He, what is the blue curve? The baseline method. The standard oh, method. Oh, it's, it's that you don't have the dynamic load balancer 
and you don't have a pie check. Oh, okay. uh, analytic Jacobian matrix okay. uh, creator. Okay. Okay. So you have some numerical approximation for the for the Jacobian matrix instead of analytical. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. So the last question from uh, this audience is about the mass storage. So how do you compare the PyJack plus LaPack approach uh, with the uh, Flamnit approach? PyJack plus LaPack approach with Flamelet approach. Yes. Uh, we didn't do this kind of comparison. Uh, actually, we are not using flamelets nowadays anymore. Uh, I don't think it makes sense to compare these two with one another. They are different methods and flamelets are based on tabulated chemistry and flamelet methods, flamelet generated manifold methods and 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 these finite rate calculations are a different thing. Uh, but perhaps I misunderstand some part of the question. Okay, okay, thank you. So uh, this, uh, another question from uh, Professor Fan Zhang. So uh, thank you very much for your wonderful presentation. Uh, the first question is, do you find the interaction between cold ignition, sorry, cool ignition flame and high temperature ignition flame? So you do you, do you find this kind of phenomenon from your results? Interaction between these two. Yeah. Yeah. So for example, over here we have a low temperature combustion, and then we have a high temperature combustion. Um, I am not sure what kind of interaction uh, he's now referring to exactly. Uh, um it's highly convection dominated problem so i don't know if 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 the question is about some kind of upstream downstream mixing uh question that may 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 emerge i mean what we sometimes see is that the position of the flame i mean of course in dual fuel you 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 don't have even a lifted flame but in diesel you have a lifted flame and then the position of this flame can vary to some extent uh, and fluctuate. So in, in, in that, that sense, I, I suppose, yes, there must be some kind of interaction between if it's not fully, fully steady. But uh, otherwise, I cannot comment it further. OK. Uh, then the second one from the same uh, audience is, what is the combustion model? Model, uh, do you use? So it's 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 a uh, implicit alias. So it means that you don't have an explicit turbulence model. You are you have a simply dissipative numerical scheme, uh, and this is this is utilized to get the mixing correct. And uh, we don't use explicit TCI model at all. So we just solve the finite rate chemistry equations. So it's like a no TCI approach. And this is certainly like a, has various k -bats. But uh, if you look at, for example, the ECN type problems, you have a very, very strong mixing. What you want is that you want to get the vapor mixing right. And we validate it for the mixed diffraction profiles. And as we know, in non premixed combustion, then ignition delay time will strongly depend on the uh, mixed diffraction value. So it ignites at the most reactive mixed value somewhere in the shear layer. Okay. And and it, you want to get that right. And and uh, based on the comparison to the ECN data, we can match the experimental data well without the TCI model. Then another question is that if you would really have a simulate until the flame, and if you would simulate uh, have, have premixed flames and different combustion configuration, it becomes another story. Uh, is the no TCI valid anymore? Okay, okay. So uh, the last question from this audience is: What is the grid size for the EDNS case? Is it a uniform grid? For the EDNS case, 
if you have four level of re grid refinement, it's I think it is it is it by by factor ten or sixteen that you you're refining the the grid size, and uh, let's say by factor ten roughly uh, you're refining the grid. So if the background is uh, sixty two microns, then the the final grid size I, I recall it is like five micrometers or something like this is the finest level, and then you want to hit make make it small enough so that you resolve the actual anticipated deflagration from thickness uh, of the of the flame so let's say the grid size is one tenth of uh, laminar flame thickness okay uh thank you so the next question is uh, uh can you talk more about how the dynamic load balancing works does it balance the load between costs across different uh, nodes different processors Uh, unfortunately, I cannot give any implementation details of this because it was uh, several PhD students who who, who used most of, most of their time to actually develop these 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 uh, load balancers. But uh, roughly speaking, distributing, uh, identifying which of the processors are doing more work, and then distributing this chemistry part between different processors, and then gathering it back and sharing it. Uh, properly so chemistry is distributed between the processors but still you can have the domain decomposition in the cfd part as as usual so i, I guess we could say that we have a chemical distribution of the chemical space between the processors and we have a distribution of the physical space between the processors in a different way okay okay thank you so uh the next question is about uh, jacobian so what is the reason you use the analytical jacobian uh with a pi jack rather than open forms in your micro jacobian for dlb form uh to my understanding, this uh, numerical Jacobian makes a rather big error in estimation of the elements of the, the partial derivatives in the Jacobian matrix. So using some kind of uh, numerical approximation formulas. And uh, especially because you have these exponential terms in the Arrhenius equation, this kind of uh, errors can become extremely large or too large that they prohibitively large so that they they start uh, disturbing the chemical uh, ke chemistry and which, which we know that is, is a sensitive process and the benefit of the pie jack and the analytical jacobian is that you calculate analytically by partially partial derivation of the reaction source terms these are heinous type uh, terms uh, you can analytically calculate what are the elements of the, the matrix, Jacobian matrix, and in this way you don't have any numerical uh, approximation in the partial derivatives, but you get them directly from the analytical formula. So you reduce the you, you, the accuracy is greatly improved with the pie jack. Okay, thank you. So uh, the next one from the same audience. So uh, could you please tell us the time required to compute the Jacobian? And the chemistry OD solver, uh, LAPEC and uh, SULEX OD integration. So, did you try with different uh, explicit and uh, implicit OD solvers? So, this is uh, the question for the uh, chemistry integration uh, cost, actually. Um, the time required to calculate the Jacobian mm -hmm. matrix. Uh, well, I, I can, I cannot like. Uh, perhaps it makes sense to simply look at these these test problems where we report the uh, let's say re relative speed up when you switch on well DLB form and then let's say from D when you go from DLB form to pi jack. Uh, so DLB form alone means in this case that you have 
the standard approximation of the Jacobian. But then when you turn on PyJack, you, you, you have the analytical estimation. So based on this one, you see that you can go, let's say, from uh, factors. To, I mean, you can still, well, these are given relative to the standard case. But anyways, if you think about it's 2.8 and 38, so you greatly reduce the uh, computational time, mean execution time, if you go to PyJack. And uh, actually, I don't know now what is the actual reason for this. Is it that the PyJack is simply faster to co compute than the numerical approach, or is it is it that you have uh, faster faster convergence or both of these at the same time? And it may depend also on the problem type that which one is actually the explanation. But uh, yes, it typically speeds up greatly the simulations as well. Okay, okay, thank you very much. Um, the next question is from uh, one of the panelists, uh, Prof. Zichen. So this, do you want to ask yourself or I'll read it for you? So if you want to ask yourself, you can unmute yourself and discuss with uh, uh, Professor Will. Okay, uh, he said he, he, he uh, is in a meeting, so I, I will read it. So thank you for the fantastic talk uh, regarding your contribution to the community by sharing DLB form. So recently, uh, they have actually absorbed uh, the load balance codes into their uh, own open source package based on open form, I guess. So they found it very effective for uh, NPR ranks in the order of uh, Hundreds, but uh, the send and the receive MPI operation overhead becomes very heavy, and the overall speed actually is uh, slower than without a load balance. So, uh, what are your comments? So, is there any uh, like you know uh, leeway to optimize the MPI communications? Thank you. So he meant actually slow when MPI ranks goes up to uh, like you know more than one thousand, or even worse in uh, like. 10,000 processors. So uh, do you have any comments for this issue? I, 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 I don't, but I suppose that my, my PhD student, Mahmoud Gadala, he, he would have very much comments <laughs> about this topic. So, so he's, he's, he's working with these kind of problems all the time. But if you if you want to call, uh, contact him and, and and discuss more, I think that he he usually gives very thorough and and uh, comprehensive answers. And and he's uh, Mahmoud Gadalla, and and he's you will find his name name and contact information from other university okay. uh, website. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So maybe you can discuss with him. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So uh, any uh, more uh, questions? from the audience. Okay. Okay, I think that there is no more questions. Okay, so um, thank you very much, uh, Professor Weir. And a very nice talk, and we learned a lot about the DLB form, yeah. Actually, we also use the finite rate chemistry for our LES for uh, gas turbine frame. Actually, the computational cost is very high. So this actually, you know, how to implement the um, efficient uh, algorithm and the accurate algorithm actually it's uh, very necessary yeah okay thank you thank you very much thank you very much for this opportunity yeah okay. thank you uh, keep in touch thank you thank you again